Hi there, and welcome to the first ever digital version of TPI Talks. My name is Stu Hume, I'm the editor of TPI Magazine. Now, for those that don't know, TPI Talks is the banner we've been using for a number of years now. Anytime we've done a panel discussion at a trade show or even our own events like Production Futures, we've always used TPI Talks as the brand to bring experts from the industry onto a stage to talk about a subject that affects all of us. Um, but now that we find ourselves in these makeshift home offices in this time of isolation, we thought we'd try and work on this new project, which was bring TPI Talks into the digital realm. So for our inaugural episode, we're turning our attention to the world of audio, specifically the term immersive audio. Now, in collaboration with DB Audio Technic, they came to us with a question saying, how is immersive audio affecting the expectations, or how might it affect the expectations of audience members in the future? And to talk about this, we um, caught up with uh, Steve Jones. And during this conversation, we kind of went through everything that DMB has to offer in terms of the immersive environment, talking about soundscape and of some of the various projects they've been involved with, specifically the Bjork tour. So yeah, take it away, Steve. Well, hi, Steve. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, just for the people at home, could you just outline who you are <laughs> and uh, you know your history within DMB? Uh, I am the, my role at DMB is education and application support team leader, a very long title, but uh, in essence for the UK and Ireland, I run the team that deliver everything in terms of all of our education and all of the technical needs of, of uh, those two markets. I want to kind of get your opinion on immersive audio when you first came across it as a concept. Yeah, I think... Uh, the word immersive is the buzz line at the moment and how people latch onto the word immersive and what it means to them, I think is very different things. I think if, if I'm to be honest, uh, immersive audio has been around for a very long time in one guise or another. Um, we've got people like Timax, for instance, who have done a, an incredible job over many years of, of delivering tools that allow us to do immersive audio. Um, but then on a more simple basis, kind of premise than that, the guys in the theatre world um, are using level and time with sound systems and speaker positioning to create the illusion of, of that sparrow voiced TV star that everybody thinks is filling the house with their voice right now when actually no, it's the sound system doing it, but, but they're, they're, they're paid to give that illusion. And, and so I would say to some extent, um, particularly in theatre, people have been doing immersive audio for a very long time it's just the technology is catching up that makes it quicker and more effective. From your opinion, what kind of projects have been kind of standouts in the last couple of years that have utilized this technology and been brought into that creative process? Talking about it in some ways is a show called Come From Away because in, in immersive terms, everybody thinks immersive and you think things flying around your head and surround sound, things going on. But with, with Come From Away, there's no surround sound speakers. It's all on, on the front of the pros. But I'd say in that show more than a huge amount of other shows, I've been absolutely immersed in the story. What the sound system did was take away any barrier between me and the performers on the stage. And everything I saw on the stage, I connected with visually, orally, emotionally. I felt immersed in the story and what, what was going on in front of me. So I was immersed, despite the fact there was no surround sound. I'd like to think immersive doesn't necessarily mean you're sat in the middle of a load of stuff. It means it means I'm sat in the story. I'm emotionally connected. I'm, um, there's no barrier in any way between me and, and the, the storyteller's communication, if you like. The Bjork show that I did was um, a fairly large part of the past year um, with a lot of people doing a lot of work for that, which started in a small lighthouse in Iceland where Bjork and a couple of her audio engineers, uh, we set up a soundscape system for her there and she started shaping and molding the, the immersive <laughs> full 360 kind of surround sound uh, storytelling that they were going to do. And then that scaled up to a venue in New York, the shed, uh, then it scaled up to a much bigger tent in Mexico. And then it went through its UK arena tour. So to see um, a story like the Bjork show of Cornucopia kind of shape and mold through these different sizes and evolve as it got bigger and bigger was, that was great to be part of. And to see as well in that the different disciplines working together on the Bjork thing. So how uh, lighting and sound interacted with each other um, was, was quite good. We became an integral part of each other's stories. If the sound happens over there, what should the light do over there? How do we grab people's attention in the audience and, and, and uh, change their emotions through sound and light together 
on a directional level, if you like. To use immersive correctly, I suppose you just have, I suppose the concept has to be there from the beginning. Would you say that? Like rather than just using the technology? Personally, and at DMB, we truly believe it is part of the future of audio. We've got a lot of obstacles to get over and things yet, but um, uh, I could say if, or I could say when audio, uh, immersive audio does become the staple part of the diet, if you like. Um, we have to stop thinking like engineers and we have to start thinking like creatives. From a creative point of view, you can do whatever the hell you like. If, if it gives you the, the effect on the audience that you intended, even if it's scientifically wrong, if it gives you the effect you want, run with it. Even if it's wrong, hey, it, it, it's about being creative right now and having fun um, in the midst of that creativity. So I think you can go into it with an amount of idea of what you want to do, but also um, uh, a bit like, I guess, painting a picture. Sometimes you don't know what you're going to paint until you've finished it. Um, mm. uh, and the storytelling that can be involved with immersive audio and what happens if I put a sound here uh, versus putting it there versus a sound at the same time appearing in front of me. And how does that make me feel? How do I respond to what's going around me? Kind of the rule bags thrown out, in my opinion, with immersive audio compared to a standard kind of stereo um, system. What other kind of barriers would you say there are? So again, using the Bjork tour as an example, we had to do a lot of work to change the standard workflow of how you load a show in. It was, it was very different with different considerations of the rigging. Um, how you design a system um, and how you think about how the sound covers the audience. Suddenly you're not just thinking about speakers covering an audience, but um, there was a lot of times where I'd be in a venue and I'm making decisions about how, where's the PA pointing today? And I'm not just looking at a speaker anymore. I'm kind of in my head imagining what happens when the object moves behind those speakers and how does that then work out into the room? Um, so, from a rigging point of view, it's different where we play speakers, the infrastructure is different, how you think about sound system design is different, and then how you mix is different. The move from mixing a stereo system to an immersive system, it's as big, if not bigger, than moving from an analog board to a digital board. Right, okay. um, it's a completely different workflow. Um, you don't work through groups so much anymore and then to a, a master bus. You're sending individual objects out to different um, objects within your sound system. So how do I do my group compression? How do we do all of the tricks in the background I used to do with my sound mix when all of that's been stripped away and the, the rules are different? So um, it's different. And when things are different, it takes people a while to get used to it. Mm. Either the kind of the system engineers or the front of house engineers that are kind of now using these, you know, using soundscape in a live environment. What's, what's the response been like from them in terms of when they are kind of recreating the mix that they're used to doing with a, you know, traditional like LNR? I, I've said to a lot of people when their first soundscape show, they'll probably struggle mm. because it's the show where you're learning to, to throw your usual tricks out when you would normally reach out for this knob here to do this effect. Well, it doesn't work anymore. So we've got to find ways around it. And, and when you are used to making this change over here on my desk gives me this change of impression of the sound, when that doesn't happen anymore, but it's a different impression, be it good or bad, but just different. The first show often is just quite, is used to getting used to that. Um, and I think once you've gone through that first show and that first learning experience, when you get to your second show, suddenly this isn't, this isn't an unknown quantity anymore. I, I learned the stuff of the first show. I'm now changing my um, workflow of how I work based on a, an experience. Hmm. Wait, have you ever come across much resistance from engineers? Like when you're kind of presenting, because it is a whole new way of working. Uh, yeah, a huge amount of resistance because it's change, because hmm. it's different. Um, and you know, if you think... I guess, especially the touring rock and roll world, we there's some incredible companies that doing an incredible job of loading into an arena in like two or three hours flat. You can only do that when you've took a process and refined it and refined it and refined it so that you are, the way your flight casing works is slick, the way your motors work is slick, the way that all of your cabling goes up to your speakers and the rigging and everything else is slick as everything and everybody knows their job inside out. So why risk that to do this weird soundscape thing where it changes everything? It's a risk on that first show. And who can afford to take that risk? Um, so again, um, 
let me go back to Gareth um, with Gareth Owen. We had lots of chats about Soundscape and there was a first few shows we looked at and he was like, should we do it on this one? And I was going, yeah, it's not the one. We, we don't have, it's not the one to take that first plunge. And then uh, Bockham came along with Starlight Express and we just looked at it and went, that is the perfect one where the risks are minimized, where we can put it in, learn, and then move on from that. In terms, if you could explain to an engineer who's used to their normal way of working from their front of house console, how does the soundscape workflow look for them? A front of house guy, um, where you would normally have a PA that you know inside out and you know the tonality of that PA and your usual tricks to make that sound how you want it to sound. Well, now um, sound comes in from the stage to your desk. You have one fader coming in. And um, instead of that fader, then that channel feeding, let's say it's kick drum, instead of that, then feeding your drums subgroup and then feeding your main left and right, effectively, you've got your one channel with your kick drum and then it's took straight back out into the system. And then I decide where I place on the stage that kick drum for the audience to hear it from that place. So all of this subgroup stuff has potentially been took away. Now there's things we can still do with VCAs and various things to still have uh, a large amount of grouping of channels, but inherently the, the workflow is not as it used to be of kind of going from multiple channels down to a small amount of subgroups down to a left and right that go out to the PA. It's now every individual channel potentially goes back out and we place it on the stage. When you go down the object based side, suddenly I hear the kick drum there, I hear the guitar there, I hear the vocal there. And as a human listener with ears on the sides of our heads, I can now zone in to each location. And as a listener, I can make sense of what's going on. The engineer doesn't need to carve these apart so that they sit right together. I can just naturally now kind of zone into each instrument and the, the separation in the mix is made for me. But the mix engineer's job now becomes about, I would say, not carving things apart in an unnatural way to make it sit together. It becomes about trying to make the voice sound like the voice should sound. How is that going to, you know, change the aud what audience are expecting from a live performance now? If, if an audience notices speakers in the soundscape system, Feel like i've not done my job properly i'm trying to make the speakers disappear i don't want them to know it's a sound system i want them to connect to a performance um so uh but that hasn't changed because i'd still say pre-immersive audio we didn't want this the audience to notice speakers we wanted them to connect to a show um we did uh knit and sawney at the albert hall with soundscape what was interesting at that was how the audience talked about the show from an audio perspective. It, it wasn't talking about um, the kick drum sounded great, the vocals sounded clear. It was, wow, I was emotionally moved by how those vocals were singing at that moment. People talk from a much more emotional connection to the music as opposed to this engineering, the kick drum sounded good, the guitar sounded amazing. Oh no, I was moved by this singer. I was moved by this harp player doing this thing. And I think that's the beauty of audiences should expect to be emotionally moved more. At the WOMAD festival last year, uh, there was a, a DMV tent with Soundscape on it. And we did a little teaching session where uh, one of my colleagues, John, explained Soundscape to just the general public at a festival. And some of the guys that were in that came back to John at a later time that day and said, you're right, I went to hear this stage over here and all the sound just came from the speaker at the side. And it was like this new revelation to the audience that what they were hearing didn't line up with what they were seeing. So I think without a doubt, we'll, we'll educate audiences better and they should be more emotionally attached to what's going on. And the, they, the storytelling element should, should be felt and heard and experienced by our audiences much, much more, I would have thought, with immersive audio. Do you think the term immersive is maybe slightly problematic? I, I, I honestly, I don't think I know what the word is yet I should be using. Um, uh, immersive surround sound uh, in DMB terms 180 360 um, there's there's so many terms that I think we do um, we get tongue-tied very quickly as to what is the right word uh, we should, should be using um, and again I go back to the the example of come from away I sat there and watched that show and there was no surround sound speakers of any kind it was all speakers on the front and I felt a hundred percent immersed in the storytelling of what was going on so I don't need surround sound speakers to be immersed. I just need to be lost in the storytelling. Yeah. Um, and in this, you know, time when we've got a lot of like engineers now, you know, stuck in home, basically, are you seeing a lot of people that are kind of doing their own little 
mini setups in their living rooms to kind of like get you know get to grips with soundscape or is that have you heard anything <laughs> like that going on yeah, yeah, we've uh, in the UK at the moment. I could, um, if I was allowed to, I, I could tell you of various mix engineers at the moment have got soundscape systems in their studios and they're, they're mixing away doing stuff with music. And, and instead of mixing at home onto some kind of 5.1 or left right system, they're mixing into soundscape and understanding what that means for them and how that changes their world. For me, I enjoy looking at and quizzing the desk manufacturers is. Um, how does a desk change with immersive audio? This usual desk layout that we have. There isn't really a desk right now that is set up to do exactly what immersive audio me needs in some ways, because they're still set up on this channels to buses to a main bus scenario, whereas kind of needs something different now. Um, and so the future, I think, looks very different. Desks look different. Sound, system look, sound systems look different. How we interact with them looks different. And what we're inherently trying to do, we're moving from this engineering to creative storytelling. Um, so it all looks different. Um, and yeah, I think people at home, there's, there's, I know my guys and various people, I, we're just playing with it and trying to take the time while we've got some time to yeah. play and see what we can come up with. Yeah, I mean, the one small benefits, I suppose, for everything that's going on, we do have a bit of time to kind of like collect all the data and kind of work yeah. out where we can go through next, you know? Yeah, in some ways, there's no excuse when whenever we come out of this time, there's no excuse that we can't say, oh, I never had time to play with that thing or read that thing or understand it. We've all got more time than we ever had, unfortunately, but we yeah. should try our best to to use it as well as we can so that when we come out of this, we can deliver the greatest shows we've ever delivered. All right, Steve, thanks very much for your time. That's all right. It's been a pleasure. And thank you very much, Steve. And thank you very much for DNB for providing all the various kind of B-roll bits from all the various shows. And thank you very much for watching uh, or listening, because this is also available uh, on Spotify as well. I hope you enjoyed that. This is obviously our first attempt at TPI Talks uh, Digital, and we're hopefully going to be improving it as more and more. And we'd love getting your feedback. And, you know, if you're listening out there and you maybe want to get involved in a similar topic or even something from video, lighting, whatever you're thinking really we just love to hear from you um but between now and then in the next episode um you can find all our information via social media by instagram by twitter by facebook if you go to um tpi magazine you can also see our latest digital edition that came out last week um yeah thank you very very much and uh yes i guess we'll see you again soon stay safe out there cheers